it's probably the first one I've seen recently for disability discrimination for menopause. This was a staff member having uh, menopausal symptoms. She was having forgetfulness, confusion, anxiety. The company knew about this. So this wasn't something that she kept. The company knew about this and they started performance management. So she wasn't performing in her role. They actually moved her to a different role, meaning she was earning less money. She didn't get a pay rise because the pay rise were linked to appraisals and she was scoring as underperforming. So she, not, she did not get the pay rise. They sent her to occupational health and occupational health said that she would benefit from retraining in her current role. But they made this, the decision that this would be too expensive. She has resigned and she has now brought a claim for disability discrimination and she has won it and she has won £65,000. It's what we talk about all the time is the company failed to make reasonable adjustments. Occupational health is just to be training. They ignored that. I don't think that would have been too expensive or a, it didn't need to be. They could have done in-house training. Just demoting her, they, there was no evidence they put anything in place to, to help her. So that is probably going to be quite a landmark case now and a warning for everyone that any kind of health condition, if you know about it, to have that discussion about reasonable adjustments. And they're called reasonable for a reason. You know, if you can't accommodate them, that's fine, but you need to be able to justify why. So them just saying retraining was too expensive, it, it didn't cut it in, in, you know, in front of a judge. You have to prove that you did everything reasonable so that they can't say, I never got that email. I've been doing a little bit of tribunal research recently and stumbled upon an interesting case. The person making the claim worked for their employer and then was dismissed for poor performance. Then a year later, they applied to work for their employer again. They needed to fill in the pre-screening application questions online. This claimant has dyspraxia. It's a condition which affects movement and coordination. People who need to write or type can find it more difficult with dyspraxia. The claimant knew that they couldn't fill in the online account and they emailed the HR team of the employer to say they were interested in the role and asked if they could have an, a phone call to go through the questions rather than needing to type them out. The HR team responded back and, and asked what specifically they were struggling with so that they could help. And they did ask that over email multiple times. The claimant never actually responded to what was wrong and in the end they couldn't make an account and the role was offered to someone else. The claimant then goes to an employment tribunal to say that the process wasn't fair for someone with a disability. And once the case goes to the tribunal, it's judged that although the employer asked multiple times over emails what the issues were with the form, they never actually responded to the query on whether the employee could make a verbal application. They only try to resolve their issue through the thing that they're having a problem with. The case then actually got appealed by the employer who, again, were like, we feel like we've made reasonable adjustments. Even at the employment uh, tribunal appeal, it was ruled that they didn't make enough reasonable adjustments by allowing them to submit the application verbally or calling them to speak to them about the issues. And the key point is that because they had worked for them before and this uh, the claimant was open about it and it was on their CV, they knew that they had dyspraxia. So they should have put two and two together and said, oh, this might be a bit more difficult and called them. If you've ever had an issue with your employees, a lot of the times we'll suggest you try and get in contact with them in multiple different ways. For someone who finds it difficult to communicate in one way, you as the employer, it's useful if you feel that you've tried to do it in multiple different methods. The other thing that I thought was useful here if you've got any applications or putting any job adverts out, make sure you've got alternative methods on there if someone has an issue that they can contact. So even if it is just a phone number at the bottom or an email or a website link or something, just so that someone who is having a problem can reach out to you. Anything to do with disability, the onus is on you to do everything possible to get in touch with people and to communicate what you're trying to achieve, not just in the easiest way, but in every way, because there will have been an award and even worse, with all of these things, other legal costs that you're going to have to have paid, what, easily £10,000 to have got to court and then to appeal it, what we took more like 20000 actually, and you'll not get that money back.
Now, you couldn't prove usually that they did get the email. They don't have to give you a read receipt, okay? But if you've sent a voicemail, you've rung them, you've sent them a text message, you've sent them a WhatsApp message, you've sent them an email. In worst case, you've sent them a letter. You might have hand-delivered a letter, although we don't tend to go there if we can avoid it. You have to prove that you did everything reasonable so that they can't say, I never got that email. Your whole process is worth nothing. That is where it went wrong. This is a bulk club. They had an investigation meeting with an employee about some complaints that they received from members. And at the end of the investigation, the manager said to the employee, I'm giving you a written warning. And then came to us, please, can you send me a template for a written warning? First of all, no, we can never send you a template for a written warning because it's very specific to the actual case. And now you absolutely cannot have a, a written warning as an outcome to an investigation. That is where it went wrong. This club absolutely wanted to continue the process and they then insisted on having a disciplinary meeting so that they can then give the warning as an outcome. We advised against this over and over and over again. If the disciplinary went ahead and the employee was given a written warning, she would just appeal that warning and say that it was pre-decided because she was already given the warning in the investigation. Or if she didn't appeal, but you used it further or not, your whole process is worth nothing, even if it's a slam dunk next time. And that is because your original process and your original warning wasn't proper. It's really important that you speak to us before you start a process in dealing with an incident. And if we say to you, you've gone wrong, there's no way to save this, then we have considered every legal option. Please understand that we would advise you as many times as we need to. We will use wording like, we strongly suggest that you don't. But at the end of the day, we are your advisors. That's as far as we can go with it. We can't make you not do it. So you're building on really bad foundations, like the leaning tower of Pisa, but worse, because it will actually fall over. So there's no point in carrying on and going, oh no, we'll just do it higher and higher because then it'll be fine. It'll balance itself out. No, no, it won't. You, there's no point going ahead because it's not that the employee is innocent. It's just that the club has followed the wrong process. We're so. not trying to tell you off. We're trying to protect you so you can get the end result you want. But if you're not going to get that, there's no point carrying on because you're just going to waste everybody's time and, and patience. We're dealing with a kind of a strange case. Like it happens sometimes, you've got two employees who don't like each other. These two people are like water and oil, they just don't get on. And then we've got the, the general manager of the club. What he did was give them ways to further uh, separate their relationship. So rather than having them work together, going through mediation, finding the issues, etc., he made a book that they could communicate to each other in. So rather than ever having to speak to each other, they could just write notes in the book and the other one could respond to notes in the book. So it now goes on for a year. They haven't spoken in person for a year. Found that one of them is now writing rude comments about the other one in the book. And because they, these two are the only two people who see it, this, it's not like a long list of people who could have written these notes. It's one person wrote about the other one. I'll use the nicer version of the word they're using. You aren't performing in the role. You aren't the cleverest person. Uh, you're consistently making mistakes. Those type of things, just imagine they're worse. And this is going on for a while again, and the manager's kind of tempering it down. He's not taking an active step in trying to solve the problem or, or agree. It's more hoping that it will solve itself. In the end, uh, we get a grievance raised by one employee, employee A, raises a grievance against employee B for all the horrible things that they've said about each other in the book and performance issues. I ran through the grievance with the manager, and having looked through everything, it was partially upheld. So there was sections of it that were, that there was truth, sections of it that we couldn't find any evidence to prove that we partially upheld it. Because one got invited to a grievance investigation meeting, the other one then raised the grievance. She's like, I'm not having it. So now another grievance raised and we're going through that process again, right? And in both grievance investigation meetings, both employees said, I brought this to you, I brought these issues to you thought you dealt with them, but it turns out nothing has been dealt with. And in there, I think it's kind of a lesson for all of us. This manager thought he could kind of just sweep it under the rug. And in the end, uh, nothing would really come of it. What they have instead is 
two grievances, two unhappy employees, both of them saying they no longer feel like they have trust in their manager anymore because they brought multiple issues to him and he didn't really do much about it. And this is all because someone didn't deal with the issue head on at the time. In case you've got anything like this going on at your club, if you don't know where to go, then reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Addressing the situation as soon as it comes around will save you this back end process that I'm going through with this manager of trying to temper down these grievances and playing whack a mole to stop everything else coming up because we didn't deal with it in the first. If you have employees on any sickness that's more than seven days, they have to provide you with a sick note to cover their entire absence. If you have an employee who's been off for four or five or six weeks and their sick note runs out, you should really be getting in touch with them sort of the day before or a couple of days before to see how they're doing, if they're returning to work, do they need anything. You're trying to establish whether they're going to come back or whether they're going to give you another sick note without asking like that. And then they should either return to work or have an arrangement with you about returning to work in that week on maybe reduced hours or light duties or something, or they should have another sick note. We're starting to see where people have big gaps in their sick notes. The other thing we're seeing is that employees just stop giving you sick notes. That's not acceptable. They have to give you sick notes. They have to continue to follow the correct reporting procedure as per the staff handbook if they are still employees. So even if their employees, you know, have gone past 28 weeks of SSP, they're not getting paid anything, but they're still employees. Even if there's no view of them soon returning, you should be talking to, about, to us about that anyway, so we can start to help take some steps, but they should still be giving you sick notes. So what do you do if you don't get a sick note? The first thing to do is to chase them um, for the sick note to say, I haven't got your sick note, I need your up-to-date sick note, please send me a sick note. If you don't get it then, you take a slightly tougher approach. And the email then says, you know, after asking you for the sick note and asking the staff out, but you haven't given that sick note. And then giving them a deadline, to give you that sick note by. If they then don't give you the sick note, that's when you then start investigation into unauthorized absence. Don't just leave it. You need to be on it because as much as it is their responsibility to give you a sick note, as an employer, you also need to make sure your house is in order and you need to be getting those sick notes from those employees. And if you're not getting it, that's where we really, really need to step in and start to help you with the um, process for unauthorized absence. You can fire anybody for anything. It's just what are the consequences going to be for you. When we ask you if someone has a protected characteristic, sometimes we send you a nice little diagram of what they are, even though we know that you know all nine of them off by heart. But sometimes they don't really mean anything to you. One of them is age. Everyone has an age. What does that actually mean? And sometimes taking a step back and seeing how it applies to your organisation, to your club. So when we talk about age, we probably have numbers in our mind that we think is old. And we have numbers that we think is young, for example. Look at your club. So are you dismissing someone in their 60s, for example, that you would not normally class as old, but they are the oldest person or the oldest employee in your club? That means there is a risk of age discrimination if they say, you dismissed me because you thought I wasn't physically able to do the job, whereas the younger people were, for example. Or again, on the flip side, someone that we would class as young, an 18-year-old. Are they the youngest person on your team? Had they been subject to comments like, oh, you're young, you don't know what you're doing, you haven't made, you're not very mature. Yes, that is age discrimination because you're, you're treating them unfavorably because of their age. Another example of sex. Again, we all have a sex. What does that mean? If you were dismissing the only female on your team, then that's quite a strong case of sex discrimination. If your team is predominantly women, then they can't say you're treating them unfavorably because they're a woman. Their case is not going to be as strong as someone who is the only woman in the team being dismissed as opposed to being predominantly women. So when we ask you about protected characteristics, we don't expect you to be expert, but it's, again, it's just thinking how it applies in your clubs rather than just how old someone is, what sex they are. 
it's always making sure that you you do talk it through with somebody on the outside to understand what those things are you can fire anybody for anything you absolutely can do that it's just what are the consequences going to be for you if you want to definitely fire this person go ahead knock yourself out but you will be sued and this is how much you're going to have to pay so just bear that in mind when you're doing it and it's the same with discrimination just because you don't think you're discriminating doesn't mean that you actually aren't we tell you to record all meetings and we don't tell you to get their consent the message is more we are recording and this is why it's obviously best practice when you're recording at the start of the meeting to say i am recording this meeting if this has happened without your knowledge i think firstly you can give some feedback and just say look if you are recording the meeting it is best practice that you let all the occupants know they're being recorded and that they're entitled to either a copy of the recording or to make their own recording secondly if you are particularly concerned you can ask what they are going to do with this recording so who is it going to be shared with where is it going to be stored because it's all gdpr you have a right to know what they're going to do with your data when you're giving your feedback just say look there are some things that we discussed that are highly confidential. That's why I need to know what is happening with this recording. Mm. And everyone needs to be bound by this confidentiality. Like that recording is not going to be shared to one who's not entitled to it. Or you can make the suggestion that if you are coming to a point where you are going to say something highly confidential that you don't think should be recorded, you're going to ask for that recording to be temporarily paused or stopped. And you can do that at the meeting. And then if they refuse to do that, you can obviously voice your concerns. And if they absolutely refuse, you can say, okay, I, I'm going to tell you, but I, again, I need your commitment that this is going to be kept confidential. Because if it's not, then it's the breach of GDPR. Best practice, you should let people know they're being recorded because if they have any concerns, they should know about it to raise them to you. But just check how you're storing this data and who you're sharing it with because it is highly confidential just had a very serious sexual harassment case come in staff member and member it involves kissing and physical touching the club have asked rather than suspend the member can they just suspend them from some areas of the club so for example the clubhouse and i would just be saying to you who's going to manage that if they walk into where they're not meant to be have you got someone on site that knows they're not meant to be in there and can take control of the situation? Probably unlikely, because that means you're going to have to tell everyone what's going on and you can't because it's confidential. Also, your other staff. This is one person that's come up with a complaint. It does not mean that your other staff don't have a complaint or that you're now putting them at risk of something happening because if you've not spoken to this member yet and they're still oblivious at thinking their behaviour is fine, you're now putting your other staff at risk as well. So I would say, obviously, I know we don't take suspension lightly, but in this situation, it's so serious that it should be suspension from the club as a whole and not just the clubhouse where the staff member is working. And this one was particularly interesting because he said afterwards, you need something to the effect of, oh, are you going to sue me now for sexual harassment? It's like, yeah, actually, why did you just do that? I don't in some way would do that you know you're not supposed to. The other thing that's been coming up a little bit talking to the golf clubs and private sector this week is people not realizing that they have to enroll for pensions. One company, very small, hadn't registered with HMRC for as an employer, which is a bit strange that you would not think, oh, I've got, I'm employing somebody. I, what do I need to do? Let me go and Google that. And then secondly, the pension. What do I need to do for the pension? So this person is now retiring and they've never made any pension contributions and that could be that they've never qualified, absolutely, but at the moment they don't actually know whether they qualified or not or what they were doing because it was run by a committee of volunteers and nobody really wanted to do that boring stuff, so nobody did. So it's just making sure that, uh, that some of these compliance things which are really quite important because if he was entitled to be enrolled and he wasn't, that £5,000 fine straight away, there was a golf club actually back in 2017 who didn't do this, and they were getting a fine every quarter of £5,000 because they were just not getting it. And eventually the committee realised actually that the club manager was not doing their job and they were parted with and they signed up etc etc but it's just it can get really expensive really quickly if you're not fulfilling your obligations if you don't make reasonable adjustments as an employer that will be considered discrimination i feel like you can never talk about this enough because it keeps coming up and this is reasonable adjustments 
I've been working with a client on a case where an employee has a long-standing history of mental health issues um, and they, this employee is really trying to come back to work. However, the questions come up in terms of how long do we need to do a phased return? How long do we need to do reasonable adjustments? They stated, for example, that the manager doesn't really want the employee to do less than 20 hours a week, which, you know, I understand from a practical point of view. However, this employee is struggling to do more than one day a week on his phased return that he's been on for three weeks. So I sort of had to bring out the big guns again and say, first of all, if you don't make reasonable adjustments as an employer, um, that will be considered discrimination. And employers should uh, treat the word reasonable in this case generously. If you think, oh, well, that's not convenient, just think about it again and think if it's possible rather than if it's convenient. Because yes, it's not convenient to have someone work less than 20 hours when they're a full-time employee, but is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. It's possible for him to work four hours a week if he wants to might not be convenient for the business because you need to hire another person to do the rest of the job, but it is possible. And that is what you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about what can be done, what this employee can do. And the question of how long for, forever. It could be that you're doing a phased return and it takes a few weeks or it takes a few months, or more likely this employee is going to hit a point, maybe two days a week, where he can't really cope with more than that. And that becomes his permanent working pattern. And I just thought I'd quickly tell you the sort of reasonable adjustments that you need to be thinking of and that is reasonable to make. Changes in the workplace. For example, if an employee has mobility issues and their office is upstairs, can you get them an office downstairs? That would be reasonable. Installing a lift, not reasonable. Changing the working pattern, like I say, reducing the hours, changing start times and finish times, giving flexibility when someone might need to leave early or start a bit later if they're having a bad day. Finding different ways of doing things. This one often gets people. There might be a different way for an employee to perform a task that might not be the way it's always been done, but that might be the way they need to do it in order to get it done because they have some sort of disability. Providing equipment and support. This is the other one that employers often struggle with. The idea of maybe employing a buddy to work alongside that person. So no longer having a person working a shift on their own, but actually having someone working that shift with them. Or using equipment to, to allow someone to be able to be helped, you know, getting something like Grammarly for someone who has dyslexia. You know, that's really helpful and necessary. And then another one that people struggle with is an alternative role. Is there something else that an employee can do other than their normal job that is more suitable for them? Or a role in which you can make adjustments for that person that maybe you can't make in their normal job. These kind of things, a judge would be like, you didn't have to do much. That's low level stuff. That's not big things. Reasonable adjustments, don't just think, oh, that's a pain, that's inconvenient, that affects everyone else, those things. Think, is it possible? Can we do it? Can we figure out a way to do it? What can this employee do? How can we help them stay in work in business? That's what it's about. Something that I've been having a few emails about and just a word of caution to everyone it's about paying employees properly when they're leaving the business so i've had over the last few weeks a few emails from acas saying this employee um, is essentially unhappy because like they're not being paid correctly when they left and can you sort it or they're going to go to a tribunal so a few flags of the things i've seen just to make sure everyone's aware notice pay will likely be stated in their contract or should be stated in their contract please abide by this so pay them what you think that they should be paid for notice or if you've got another side agreement that's not written down or something just abide by that it's clearer there's no headaches there with holiday pay anything that they've accrued 
but unused should be paid to them. Again, that way it's clear, it's stated, if necessary, when you're sending them the letter, if you need to put the extra details in just to make sure it's clear, then do that. But I've had a, a club come back and say, actually, we thought he was only owed like a hundred pounds for holiday, but turns out it's like 300 pounds and that's why the guy's kicking off. The big one that I'm seeing a lot is people who are paid per week, not actually being paid per week. So I, I had a club who were, had an employee who was being paid for 40 hours a week, meant to be paid per week. But instead they were paying him 160 hours a month for four weeks in the month, right? Which you assume is right, but not every single month has four weeks in it. So over the course of his employment, he was underpaid by 2000 pounds. They've had to then pay that. And that wasn't a nice thing for the manager to realize when I was like, can you go back and just double check the math? He was like, oh wait, this was actually a massive flaw. So making sure you do all that homework before paying the employee at the end will save you a whole lot of hassle when ACAS come knocking on the door saying this employee is willing to go to a tribunal if this isn't settled. I know that there's, there's been a few other examples, but those are the main ones I've seen so far. Making sure notice is paid properly, making sure outstanding holiday is calculated properly. And if someone's being paid per week and actually paying them per week, rather than assuming what the weeks are in the month. And the other thing as well, which makes it a lot easier, legally you don't have to do this, is if on your pay slips, you detail out holiday being paid as a separate line. You don't legally have to do this, but if you do, it is so much easier to have those conversations about how much holiday is owed because you can actually prove that you have paid X number of days in that year. And I'm going to say you get a lot less challenges on it because everybody can see what we're doing. By his own admission, he's a touchy person. Uh, so, yeah, just wanted to continue with the case that we've mentioned a couple of times, the sexual assault one from a member. They are going to do a disciplinary with him, um, but they were looking at um, suitable sanctions to um, deliver to him. And a couple of things that were discussed was a temporary suspension and also an alcohol ban for maybe one or two years. The issue with both of them options really is uh, temporary suspension is eventually going to come back. If we're going to temporarily suspend him, that's admitting that he has sexually assaulted someone. Therefore, why would it still be okay to do that in six months time? It doesn't matter about the duty of care. The risk of that is when he does return, there's a risk of a constructive dismissal claims if they've got over two years service because he's now returned and employees may not want to work with him knowing that he's sexually assaulted their colleagues in the past. Also with the alcohol bans, this man's own admission, he admitted that he was drinking, but he said he wasn't drunk. So an alcohol ban wouldn't make a difference. He's still potentially going to do the same thing. And by his own admission, he's a touchy person. Uh, so yeah, it's, I don't think banning him from alcohol is going to stop him being a touchy person. Our advice is if you've found that there has been sexual assault, you can't temporarily say, well, you can't come near our staff. You need to expel them. Um, and all of that wouldn't sit well with an employment judge either. Um, since then, that person's wanted to resign from the club rather than go through the disciplinary. An issue with allowing them to resign is that there then won't be a sanction against that person. So they could return as a guest or a visitor particularly as his wife um, is also a member of the club. So we would always advise that you follow through with the disciplinary to be able to issue a sanction and therefore expel them permanently. An employer is not responsible to continue to employ an employee who is not able to do their job. We don't come across this terribly often, nobody does really. One of our clients has an employee that had an accident. She broke her leg in Turkey on holiday. She had surgery in Turkey after the accident and came back to the UK and the surgery was not correct, it was substandard. This employee is now going to be off for at least 18 months. At least 18 months is what her consultant said. And the club wants to know, how do we deal with this? What do we do? Can we hire someone? One thing they're not realizing, and I'm surprised because usually the first question someone would ask is, do I have to keep them? They haven't asked that question. So I have pointed out that actually 
an employer is not responsible to continue to employ an employee to that length of time who is not able to do their job. Now, it is a fine line and it is very much case by case, but once you've run through the long-term sickness process, and generally when you're sort of getting past the six month mark, if there is no return date on the books or that return date is not within a couple of months, at that point, you can actually start a process of dismissing that employee for incapacity. It is a long process. Um, it's an SOSR dismissal. So the process is a little bit different than uh, investigation and disciplinary and then dismissal. You will have to look at every other option in your business, even if this person is a chef, but maybe you have a reception job available. You know, you might need to look at other options. But if you are in that position, you're not expected to keep an employee on for such a long time or indefinitely if they aren't capable of working. There are processes that you can follow to actually terminate that employee. You know, if you ever come across something like that, give us a call, we can help you through that process. It's the kind of thing that you think is really innocent, but actually can land you in a bit of situation. I'm dealing with a club right now who had an employee who was like a club admin, who they then had vacancy offer up uh, a different role. So they said, yeah, you know what? Trial period, you're going to do this for six weeks and then we'll come back. What they didn't do at any point was put that in writing. So they've just gone on and said to her verbally, yep, yeah, this is now your job for six weeks on trial, but we haven't written that down anywhere. We haven't stipulated what the terms and conditions of the trial are. We haven't said that if this doesn't go well, that that you, you might fail the trial. They haven't given any of that possibility. Now coming to it, the person's not succeeding well in the trial. The reason they're not is because of a disability. They've got dyspraxia. That makes it difficult to sometimes put words together, things are, uh, start jumbling around and it's really affecting the role they're doing. However, because this club haven't written down at any point that this is a trial period or etc., the role is taken as permanent, the change is taken permanently. So now they have to deal with an employee who is not doing well in their new role because they didn't go through the trial. And the risk here is, let's say the club say you failed the trial and put them back down to the role they were doing. This person can now flag and say, have you done that because I've got a disability? Or where is it that you told me that there was a trial that I may fail? Where did you tell me that? If you never told me that, I assume that I, like, you'd given me this role. So for them, it's a bit of a risk. It's a bit of a flag. So the ideal is you follow the full process. You give them a letter. You stipulate the details of the trial. And you have review meetings so that at no point would they be caught unaware to say either this is not going well or this is going well. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the quiz. The trial period or probationary period can be any length you want it to be. True or false? It is true that because the trial period has no basis in employment law whatsoever. It can be any length up to two years because under two years there's no protection from unfair dismissal. But you don't have to have one. It could be a week, it could be three months, it could be six months, it could be two years but there's no legal requirement for any particular length. What's the maximum award that a company would have to pay if they lost a discrimination case at tribunal? 10,000, a million, unlimited, or one year's pay? It is unlimited. This is why we're always so uh, emphasizing have they got a protected characteristic? Is there a potential of a discrimination claim? I'm going to say it's not usually as much as the sort of 3.5 million that the bankers got from the city of London, but they can add on quite a lot of money. How long can employees self-certify their sickness leave for? Seven calendar days, five working days, three calendar days. They can't, they have to have a fit note. It is seven calendar days, five working days. Now, is that Monday to Friday or is it five of their working days? Or if the club's open all the time, is it any five working days? And it's exactly for that reason that we don't use the designation working days. We only use seven calendar days, then it's seven calendar days, whether they were supposed to be working or not. 
How much company sick pay or enhanced sick pay do you have to pay if you employ more than five staff? One week full, one week half, one month full, one month half, SSP, or depends on the contract. SSP is what you have to pay, okay, if they qualify, and it also depends what's in your contract. So both of those are correct, but it's looking at both of those together to see what they have. The fact that you've got more than five staff with a red herring, that's relevant to health and safety, but it's not relevant to employment law. When do employees start earning annual holiday? After the trial period, from day one, after one year service, if they are performing well. It is from day one. Very good. I did speak to a potential client who stayed a potential client and never signed up with us because they said, oh yeah, we don't let anybody have any holiday in, in the first year of employment. They can only have it from the second year. It's like, okay, we're not going to be working together. How much holiday are employees entitled to if they work five days a week? Is it 20 days plus eight days bank holiday, 5.6 working week, 28 days, or 28 days including bank holidays? All of those are correct because they are all the same just differently phrased. So 20 days plus 8 days is 28 days. 28 days including bank holidays is the same as 20 days plus 8. 5.6 working weeks times 5 working days is 28 days and 28 days. So all of those are correct. Employees with less than 2 years service can just be fired. True or false? It is true. Now, we've got 50-50 there. They can just be fired. We obviously are looking at protected characteristics, but if there aren't any, they, you just say it's not working out, off you go. Whereas if they're over two years, that's never an option. And so that was really good. Well done, everybody. Those are the basics that I go through when I'm talking to club managers at golf clubs. It's just quite scary sometimes. These are the basics. This is not how to do a disciplinary process. This is not how you do a good restructuring. This is not how you deal with sexual harassment claims. This is the nitty gritty everyday stuff that needs to be known. So it's just making sure that your team knows it as well so that there aren't any inadvertent issues with anything. No one should be at a financial detriment when they're on holiday. There was a ruling many years ago now that if someone's doing sort of regular, consistent overtime, regularly receiving commission or bonuses, then you take the average of their pay when you pay their annual leave. So I guess key for you is just, um, if you have external payroll providers, just make sure they're aware of this and they're not just naturally putting their, their normal hourly rate. There are some calculations, but it does really only affect people that do it consistently and regularly. You know, one bonus a year is not going to change it. The odd hour or two overtime every couple of months is not going to change it. We're talking consistently. That's when it would change. The new ruling was about if staff tried to go to a tribunal and claim unlawful deduction of wages, they could only claim for the most recent deduction. Or if there was more than one, they had to be less than three months apart. So holiday pay, for example, if you took holiday in January and you were paid wrong, and then you took holiday in August and were paid wrong, you can only claim for your August one. That's what the rule was. So the new ruling is now basically saying that they can go and back claim for all of the incorrect deductions, not this three month rule in between or this most recent. In the UK, when we look at pay claims, we always say you can go back two years. They're actually looking at getting rid of that as well and making it indefinite, as in from when the wrongdoing was. So watch this space for that. So um, I think key for you, if you come up to a new holiday year, just make sure your payroll providers know to take into consideration so it, commission, bonuses and overtime. And I think overtime is going to be the most re the likely one here. One of the areas specifically, golf clubs, to look at is if you have greenkeepers who work, you know, one in three weekends, one in four weekends, and they get overtime for that weekend work, this is the kind of overtime we're talking about. Um, look into it, make sure you're including that and you're not just giving them a day rate for their holiday pay. So I had a, a interesting call from a club manager. Essentially, they found out that uh, one of their greenkeepers has been having inappropriate conversations online. It's not too 
specific, but the person that they've been having them with, they're not the same age. So he says this in front of all the rest of the greenkeepers, everyone shot Cora is like, what on earth is going on here? That's not right, report it to the GM. Now, the reason I wanted to bring it up is I think the club handled the initial situation quite well. I think it's probably a good template in this type of situation to use. So what they found out is this person is raised to the rest of the greenkeepers. I've been speaking to someone online. We are very different ages and they are a minor. The head greenkeeper immediately takes it to the GM, raises it. So he could have sat on it. He could have said, oh, that's not right. Or da da But no, he took it straight away because he knew that this might be serious. DM called us straight away, said, what do we do? I said, OK, based on the information that we've got here, we don't know a lot of what has happened. All we know is that he said something. So investigation meeting, that's what that's for. for to get the initial detail. Club hold the investigation. The employee is claiming that the conversations are completely clean, that there's nothing uh, sinister happening here, and it just so happens that they're friends. The club then realized, oh, he said this in front of other people, let's corroborate. So they take witness statements from the other greenkeepers. Turns out that this employee also said, if anyone's got a problem with this, let's go outside, I'll fight you about it. Um, So now, we could have had a situation where the club sat on this for a really long time. It could have turned out to be a major problem and we would have found that after the fact. But instead, they were proactive all the time, always asking questions, always raising it to us. And now we found out that they've made threats against other people and that there's an issue online that we can deal with. In case you're ever in similar situations that are like a bit murky and um, we're not exactly sure what's going on, please call us and let us know like as soon as we can do, because it's easier for us to, to call and go through a situation at the time than fix the problem after the fact and, and work out whatever's been missed. If you do find something like this and you feel it's something you should report to the police, you are fully within your right to do so. You are not breaching any GDPR nonsense or anything like that. Any person comes aware of something like this could report it to the police. You can't treat COVID any different from anything else in your business right now if an employee calls in sick with it. I'm going to talk to you today about COVID. There are new variants, people are getting ill. You know, it looks like there's going to be another winter wave of this, just like with every other flu. And so I thought I'd update you a little bit on where we are with it and what you can and can't do as an employer. First of all, you cannot make your staff take a test. You can ask them to take a test voluntarily. You can explain the benefits of them taking a test so that they know if they're infectious or whatever. But if they say no, thank you, nothing you can do. If they do take a test voluntarily, and they test positive, what do you do then? You can ask employees to stay home. The guidance at the moment is five days from testing, but you can ask employees to stay home. However, if you ask your employee to stay home because they have COVID, you have to pay them in full, not sick pay, in full, because they are willing to work just like they might be with a cold or a backache and you are the one asking them to stay home, so therefore they should not be worse off by getting SSP or something. You'll have to pay them in full. The other thing is if they contact you and say, I've taken a test, I'm positive, I'm really ill, I want to stay home, then it's SSP. You treat it just like every other sickness. So calling in with COVID at the moment is just like calling in with a bad tummy or a bigger ache or a fever and you treat it exactly the same way. You don't say to the employee, okay, fine, but you know, you need to stay home for five days. If the employee then comes back to work after three, you're gonna have to go roll with that, or you're gonna ask them, you know what? It's only been three days since you tested positive. Can I ask you to stay home another two? I'll pay you. So that's the golden rule. You want them to stay home? You pay them in full. They call in sick, you treat it like any other sickness. You can ask them to test, but you can't make them. Really evaluate if the staff you have on zero hours are true zero hours, because I think there is a push to get people off these contracts. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Workers' Predictability Act. Basically, the government are going to allow zero hours workers the opportunity to put forward um, a request for a predictable working pattern. Obviously, that's sort of the opposite reason why you have zero hours workers at the moment. 
ACAS are currently going for a review to put forward some guidance on how employers can manage this and what the expectation is on an employer. But what we're going to really recommend to you, I suppose, at this stage is sort of having a look at what your zero hours workers are and seeing if you can potentially move any to part time because this predictable working pattern might pretty much defeat the whole purpose of having your zero hour workers. So if you guys want to just start having a little look at what you have people on for zero hours um, and it might be worth even looking at moving them to part time at lower hours, so maybe guaranteeing four hours a week. The hours you put in the contract are the minimum hours you have to offer them. You can ask them to work more than that and that would just be typical overtime. If you're consistently doing that, they might argue to you that actually these are my hours. By custom and practice, my hours aren't four, they're 16. If you've been given above consistently every single week and by doing that that's obviously going to affect their annual leave entitlement so they could make that claim and you'd have to look at it seriously the only detriment it'll put you at is if you've got a contract for four hours and you're consistently rostering more than that their annual leave entitlement is based on four hours but what you're paying for them you'd have to take into account all of that overtime so their annual leave is now worth a lot more than if they were working at a true four hour a week contract the entitlement so how many days entitlement they get per year is based on the hours of their contract let's say four hours a week equals five days annual leave if they work yeah. more than that they're still entitled to five days annual leave but it's not going to be five days at you know four hours a week it's because they're consistently working 30 hours a week what you pay them for each day is now worth more because their overtime needs to be taken into account when you work out how much to pay them for each of those five days so i had a, a case of um, with a club and I just thought it was a useful reminder on protected characteristics. We've got an employee who has got a skin condition. Now it's not drastic but they are sometimes required to clean behind the bar or wash up or touch chemicals and dependent on the chemicals it can really irritate their condition and quite sore and quite uncomfortable for them. Now this club's policy is that they normally wear short sleeve shirts and the employee has asked whether she can wear a long sleeve shirt or a jumper to stop chemicals or anything that she's touching affecting her skin condition. Now this is a long-term condition classed as a, possibly classed as a disability and it seems like a reasonable adjustment for her employer to allow her to do something to make sure that her condition isn't uncomfortable. Her employer didn't agree and for the past three years hasn't allowed her to wear a jumper, hasn't allowed her to wear a long sleeve shirt. It turns out that her manager did allow a different employee and actually bought them specifically long sleeve shirts for them to wear at work because they also have a skin condition. So when the first employee raises up in arms saying, well, why have you done that for this person? We haven't done it for me. The employer couldn't give a satisfactory answer. There isn't too much difference in both the conditions. One person is just meant to get on with it and keep going and the other person has been given an adjustment and given additional support by the employer to help them. If this employee now decides to go make a claim saying that I've been discriminated against because of XYZ, because they haven't done something for my condition but they've done it for someone else, and what's the difference between me and them, it's on the club to make a clear defence of why that's not discrimination. And on the face of it, having gone through those with them, it would be. So in case we're ever asking you about protected characteristics, this is why. These are the kind of things we need to know because this now changes how I'll deal with the club and how we'll go through this process because there's a risk here. And it means that we can advise you if there's something that for you might come up as a bit of a problem, we can help make sure that you, you align that and get that fixed before it goes too far down the road. I just wanted to let you know about a case that's recently been heard at the tribunal. And this is in regards to dead naming. This is where someone has transitioned, but their employer continued to use their old name, their, their previous name. Now, this is quite an extreme example. When you read it, it's, it's just shocking. So two years um, this went on. So their locker, rather than properly changing the name of the locker, they just scribbled out the old name or put a cross and put a post-it note with a new name. Their access um, pass, you know, to get them into the doors, they never updated it. So this person can access any secure area with getting someone else to sort of use their swipe card. So this is quite an extreme example. The claimant won and was awarded £25,000. Sometimes when we talk about change of names, you can sort of default to, you know, I need an official document, like a you know change of name deed poll, etc. 
you actually don't need them in these situations. Things like door passes, lockers, um, spreadsheets, you don't need an official document to update that. When it comes to their contract, you may want more. People are dissuaded from getting a change of name deed poll in this situation um, because it costs more and it's not as legally binding. There is now a certificate and I, that can confirm the new names. You can accept that rather than have to ask for a deed poll. But even before we get to the contracts, there are things you could do straight away, which is lockers, door passes, spreadsheets, communications. And when we talk about dead naming, you know, it's that open dialogue with this employee because people have known them as this name for many years. They may say the wrong name and it may be an accident. That's OK, but it's when you're deliberately doing it or saying, I don't, I'm not going to call you that because I don't agree. That's when we start getting to the territory that this council found themselves. You know, they just did not acknowledge this was happening, made the person feel really uneasy, just scribbling their name out. Um, and yes, £25,000. Um, but it's the first case of dead naming in a tribunal. And I expect there's going to be many more. It's uh, lovely to be back in the UK. It's a little bit cooler than in Egypt, which was 37 degrees. What was interesting was as always seeing in a different country how they do stuff and going hmm that's a good idea or hmm I'm not sure why we're all doing this one of the interesting things was going down the Nile which was a lovely cruise absolutely fantastic but all the boats are leaving Luxor on the same day at the same time and they're stopping all the temples down the river on the same days at the same time so all of the temples are always full with all of the tourists now that would make sense for the sellers of the gifts and everything like that because then they only have to be there for like two hours a day and they can go do something else for the rest of the time so it's like a part-time job and i'm just wondering is that the reason i did try and talk to my guys about this but they looked at me like i was mad it's like well of course this is what we do i'm like okay but if we spaced it out then there'd be more space in the temples and we wouldn't have hundreds of tourists in there all at the same time with no air conditioning and no fans and they're like still don't see what your point is so i'm like okay fine we'll leave it if you're looking at your systems do you have to do the things you're doing the way you're doing them i don't mean employment law obviously there are rules that need to be followed but when you're dealing with your members with your customers just because the way it makes sense to you doesn't necessarily make sense to them. And it's just just having a step back and going, hmm, who does this actually work for? Why are we actually doing it this way? Could we do it a different way? I went on a training course this week uh, about redundancy. It was run by ACAS. Uh, these kind of things are useful to get any tips from anyone else to see if there's things that people are thinking about that might be useful um, for us to pick up. And there is one. If you've ever been through the redundancy process at all, you'll know that with us, we'll take you through every step, every meeting, every email you need to send to make sure that you're covered. Now, the part that you may do yourself is the redundancy consultation meeting. So this uh, will be the first time or uh, the first of a few times that an employee can discuss why is this happening? How did you make this decision? How does this affect me? It's their chance to voice anything they've been thinking about. A lot of times, and I don't mean our clients, I mean in general, a lot of times people can brush off this meeting and be like, ah, oh, it's just like a box to tick on the way to the end of the redundancy. This training was useful to remind everyone that a, your employees will deserve better than that. They deserve for you to explain to them exactly why it is happening, what you can do to support them, what they need to do, etc., so that they know all the detail. Because it's not a nice experience to go through. And if it means that you've got to this point where it has to be done, that's fine. But let's not make a bad situation even worse. And the other thing that is useful is sometimes your employees might know one or two things about the business that you aren't really aware of that could be a better method than the redundancy you're thinking about. So like, for example, I had a redundancy case a few months ago where an employee said, actually, the revamp that we're doing of the clubhouse is really expensive and we've ordered, we all know that we don't need it. So you could put that on hold and do this redundancy later on in the year. The club decided it was viable and decided to do that instead. Sometimes uh, an employee, it may not always happen, but they might know something or find a different way around the process, which helps you and helps them. The training showed us a few tribunal examples of what happens when employers don't take alternatives into consideration. And sometimes they end up in a tribunal because they haven't followed the full process, they haven't done everything necessary, and it looks more like they tried to get someone out rather than viably doing a redundancy. 
and make sure in that meeting you get as much detail to the employee as they need to know. Treat that meeting importantly. And if they've got any suggestions, make sure you can either evidence this doesn't work for us and that's fine, or really review it and, and obviously speak to us and we'll help out to see whether you could go with it or whether a proposed redundancy would be better. There are some situations when we don't think Chupi applies but they apply in more situations than you think. So the first was a club wants to outsource their accountancy, all the accountancy outsource it to a contractor. They have someone doing accountancy part-time, bookkeeping part-time. So we said, okay, but that's a cheapy. Um, and the club were like, well, are you sure? Because that's a consultant, that's someone coming in and they're not gonna want to employ, you know, Jane, who does the accountancy. Um, So actually it is, the job is not going anywhere, you're just moving it to someone else. If you went ahead, you got a contractor in, she would naturally chew you over to the new employer. Now in this situation, unfortunately there are protected characteristics, multiple, so we've discussed redundancy. Redundancy is not a viable option because the job is not redundant, it's just being outsourced. Um, So this is likely going to end in a settlement because the contractor does not want a member of staff, they want to do everything themselves. The second um, scenario is a club has a contractor doing the cleaning and this contractor employed two members of staff to clean for the club year round. The actual contractor has given the club notice to leave, which means the club now has to find another contractor to do the cleaning. And what they didn't realise that actually, because these two staff members were appointed to work for them solely, that if they get another contractor, which they have to do because the other one's given notice, those two staff members will chupy over to the new contractor. So again, it's really, but I don't understand. And they're useless, they're rubbish at cleaning. And it's unfortunately, yes, this is a chupy situation. So what I will say to you is if, you, if you're doing any kind of changes, people coming in, changing contracts, just check with us first because it applies in more situations than you perhaps think it is. We are getting a lot of calls from um, businesses we don't work with, actually. And they they start off with saying, oh, I've taken on some staff. And we're like, okay, when you say taken on, and they say chupi, like, great, they know what they're talking about. Um, We don't have any contracts, and I don't know what their hours are. It's like, oh dear, here we go. When you are chuping staff into your company, into your club, you are taking on all liability for this employee. So it's absolute paramount. You know what you're taking on. And if you haven't got a contract in place, I'd be saying to you, stay away, really. Uh, This is a a major red flag. You need to know absolutely everything to do with their terms and conditions, because under Chupi, you cannot change their terms and conditions. And if you don't know what they are, you're going to struggle with not changing them. And it's you that's going to be sued for changing them. So make sure you have all the information you need. And you're meant to have it at least 28 days before the staff Chupi into you. We have a spreadsheet that we can give you, which is what you'll need. And it's, again, it's things you wouldn't think of. So yes, all the contractual terms, but actually flexible working patterns, reasonable adjustments, make sure you absolutely have all the information you need before you say yes to this transfer, because all their baggage, all their luggage, as we call it, is coming across to you. Thanks for watching. If you want a free tribunal audit of your employment contract and handbook, click the link in the description below.